Welcome back. If you guys have noticed over the last uh, few years, there's been a few people, uh, most notably, you know, what happened with Andrew and several other people that have been able to create massive amounts of engagement online through affiliate accounts and, and all kinds of stuff like that. There's a bunch of different social media strategies for people who are trying to keep up with that. The algorithm is constantly changing. It is a very, very difficult road to hoe. And what I have today with me, uh, my guest is Logan Forsyth. He is the founder and co-CEO of Media Scaling. He is, uh, we're working with him right now. Uh, he is responsible for 2.1 billion views. Is that what you just recently got? We are past 2.5 billion now. 2.5 billion views. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, yeah, man, welcome. Welcome to the show. Yeah, no, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on. Uh, what you do is so fascinating. Like even before we you know, decided to work together, I just, it was basically, and for those of you who don't know, what you said before was do the Andrew model in-house. Can you, can you go into that? Yeah, so essentially what we do, the company is media scaling. We work with top personal brands, creators, podcasts, and we guarantee up to 150 million views in the first 90 days working with us. So how it works and why you're referencing it as the Andrew model in-house is because we do it through creating a network of what we call secondary accounts that are branded per client. So we got started working with you as well. We want you to be one of those next creators, the top of the list. And so it'd be examples like Michael Sartain, Michael Sartain Reels, Michael Sartain Clips, Best of Michael Sartain, so on and so forth. We'll create these accounts across uh, the top five platforms of Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, Snapchat. We'll incorporate X is uh, starting to gain momentum and steam yeah. in there now. And um, these accounts allow us to do very high volumes of short form content. So we'll work with these top creators who have been creating long form content for generally long period of time. We'll dedicate an entire team of editors, account managers, go in, repurpose it, take the long form, uh, create a very high volume of short form with top quality, and then post it out. And we're usually posting between 1800 to 4200 times per month per client starting. And when you do that level of volume mixed with top quality content, a lot of the posts go viral, you gain a lot of new reach, and then we'll take that and funnel it back to the main socials and uh, just experience growth across the board. Yeah, I had Pearl Davis on, and she was sitting right there, and she's like, yeah, I do 30 shorts a day. I was like, 30 a day? And then with you guys, that's like rookie numbers. That's like that's pretty small. Yeah, like total post on yeah. across. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with your package, I believe that we're at 140 posts a day. Yeah, 140, 140 yeah. 150, something like uh -huh. that a day. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. My feed is just like, oh, yeah, <laughs> it's really annoying because like my girlfriend thinks that I'm just looking at videos of myself and I'm uh, like, no, I just follow all these accounts and they're just me. Um, no, I, it, it is pretty, a pretty amazing thing. So that happens. And there's another thing that you talked about in another interview that I thought was interesting. Mm -hmm. And this is the concept of like, so for instance, we'll go back to the Andrew Tate model. Uh, Andrew Tate did not have a TikTok, but he had a bunch of uh, affiliate accounts that fed back back into um, Hustle University and then later on The War Room. Yep. And so when he did that, it was one of these situations where the algorithm didn't just recognize Andrew Tate from an account because he didn't mm -hmm. have one, but his his image, his actual face, yep. the, you, you're saying the algorithm was able to detect a certain person's face. Is that, is that what you've seen so far? Yeah, definitely. So algorithms have gotten scary good across all the social platforms. They know who's in it, what's being said, et cetera. So a big part of this concept, we call it social SEO, but even if someone engages with one of the clips from the secondary accounts and they don't follow the account, it will still start to serve more content from that account and from the other accounts and from your main account as well, because it knows this is all in this scenario, Michael Sartain content and that Michael Sartain is in that content that they're watching. And if they engage with it, it shows that they generally have a positive reaction to that content and they wanna see more of it. Yeah. So it'll start to bring them into the world. Can you talk about the randomness of the algorithm? Like how you can post something on one platform, nothing happens. You post it on another platform, it goes viral. It doesn't make any sense. Like there is a, a certain level of randomness to it. Yeah, it's, it, there is a certain aspect of a lottery system yeah. to it. Like just, you know, we're here in Vegas going to the slot machines yeah. and just pulling the levers, which is why we want to be across platforms as well. Yeah. Because it gets so much more mileage out of each piece of content. A lot of the time, if we like, we'll post a, a piece of content and it will go up on, let's say YouTube channel, it will do average on there. We'll post that same video on, let's say Instagram and it'll get 4 million views. Yeah. Right. And so every, if you're not posting across channels, you're not omnipresent across the board, you're just missing the mark on so many opportunities. And if you only had posted the uh, short in the example I just used on YouTube, you just missed out on 4 million people yeah. 
that you could have reached on the other platforms, right? Yeah, so. yeah, that's a, a couple of things. First off, like uh, from statistics, central limit theorem, as n approaches infinity, the returns start to look like a normal distribution. So it's like, mm. you're going to get some go viral the more you post, right? right? You're just more at yeah. bats. And that's kind of mm -hmm. the, the, the theory here is the more at bats. Yeah. Uh, because sometimes the algorithm chooses you or sometimes the algorithm does not choose you. I I'll tell you right now, there's a bunch of TikTok creators right now who are famous because of one video that the algorithm randomly chose to make mm -hmm. them famous. Uh, and so it is kind of that that is kind of the the issue when it comes to that. Um, the facial recognition thing you were talking about was pretty amazing. Um, have you seen anything like specifically with that where like because um, I've noticed one time I, I did this where I had a video where I actually made some it was a reaction to Andrew Tate. I know Andrew and mm. he uh, and I reacted to something that he did and it went viral and everything else I did after that got um, got ratioed. What platform is that on? Instagram. Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. So Andrew Tate, I mean, he's, he's a big one to where we have dealt with that in our content of having him even in the B-roll or if someone's talking about him in the clip, that uh, post will get shut down. The account can get flagged. So uh, I mean, that just proves. Like, is it more so on person. TikTok or is it on Instagram? TikTok's the worst. Yeah. That's It'll what happen I'm saying. on Instagram as well, but TikTok is by far the worst. Yeah. That's what I've seen. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that, that I've seen is a lot of content from people who are like anti any of that top that co topic of conversation. Mm -hmm. So you know, yep. Rolo Tomasi Manosphere. Mm -hmm. Those people who are anti that they tend to get a huge push on TikTok. I'm seeing some of their accounts blow up where they're getting like 80 views on YouTube and like 400,000 views on TikTok. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing that. It, it kind of feels like each one of these uh, platforms kind of shapes their own uh, environment. Yeah, I mean, you have to like look at that, and, and there's some aspect that gives you that feeling a little bit. You know, when you see those views, but. Um, it, it can just be crazy. I mean, we have people who have large followings and a lot of success on one platform and just haven't cracked into that on yeah. the other platforms. But there's something that we've experienced as well. It's just, we call it a delayed explosion to where we've worked with clients and uh, we'll blow up fast on, let's say Instagram and TikTok will be slow going and we'll post for two months, three months, and then maybe month four in, it's just that one post takes off and goes viral. Next thing you know, everything snowballs. Your account gains 10,000 followers, 20,000, 50,000 followers overnight. Um, and so there is an aspect of when you're on social media, you're posting content. The content needs to be great. You need to have good hooks, yeah. good value to back it up. But also just follow with consistency. Don't get discouraged if you're a month in, two months in and not seeing the results that you want because it's not a linear process. It truly is exponential. It snowballs and it can happen overnight. The longer you do this, the more uh, chances that, again, you're, uh, mentioning your giving of going at at bat as another viral home run and yeah. really snowballing the whole process. Which platform do you think is the hardest to gain traction on initially? Facebook was very successful for us earlier in the year of 2023. And it just kind of flipped a script in like June, July to where we haven't had a lot of traction with real specifically in our strategy on Facebook. Outside of that, the rest of the platforms, um, I would say Instagram is our main top successful platform, but there's still plenty of times when it's YouTube or plenty of times when it's TikTok, Snapchat even will take over as well, which is an underestimated one that we can uh, talk about a little bit. Yeah. Um, so overall, it does vary across the board. Uh, those are the four platforms that I just listed off that we see the most success in. Facebook struggling a little bit. And then X has started to pick up some steam on video. I've seen uh, Elon talking about them doing a push with video yeah. and different interviews and even uh, playing around with the idea of adding a video tab there on the bottom, like the Reels tab on Instagram. Um, so we'll see, but we've been testing out more with X as well. And it, it's been like varied results, um, but they are starting to do more of a push. When I see uh, a lot of creators tried that aren't on YouTube, try to get to YouTube, that seems like that's the hardest one to me. Mm. I feel like the, the because of the long form content, YouTube, mm. the it's not that the the viewers are more skeptical. It's just you have to do more to keep their attention. That's what it yeah. feels like. Because I see, I have several female friends of mine that were huge models. Instagram just dominate 8 million followers. They try to do a podcast. They can't get 80 downloads. Mm -hmm. Like that kind of thing I see far more often than the other way around. So that's mm -hmm. why I've always felt like YouTube is the one that is, whenever um somebody wants to come on the show, I'll frequently, I look at the IG. Okay, you got a sure. million followers. Mm -hmm. First thing, I'll go on Social Blade. Yep. I learned about that a long time ago. Uh, and then, and then the, the the last thing, the thing that proves it for me is YouTube. And it's like if I go on YouTube and I see the guy has four hundred thousand views on every one of his views on, on uh, Instagram, and then I go on YouTube and he has eighty down eighty views. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, he bought this. Most likely, he bought this following. Right. And so that's kind of the the thing that I've noticed. You, one of the things you did for us, which I thought was great, is when you did the Loom video and you presented it to us in the very beginning. Yep. You had basically reverse engineered my whole 
uh, uh, organic strategy. Oh yeah. 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 And can you go into that? Like what tools were you using to find out every single thing about, cause a lot of people you guys don't know that are like, right. Uh, he doesn't have your login and your password, but yet he can find out your average view per clip. How, mm -hmm. wh where do you get all that data? Yeah, I wish that I knew more specifics, but we have an incredible team and yeah. our data analyst has built like this API scraper that uh, they just use and take it through an automation process. So it's so, an in-house program that yeah. he's using. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so it'll just scrape through and, and see all the, the metrics on the socials, the views, the follower growth, et cetera. And then that's a large part. Uh, we just, that's part of our 90 day audit that we'll conduct with the new client coming yeah. into it to be able to confirm uh, what level of guarantee we're comfortable to provide, um, which is why we say up to 150 million views. Yeah. Usually it ranges between 30 to 150, yeah. depending on uh, a lot of variables such as where you're starting from, how much content there is to go off of. And then also we have different tiers of packages to where the higher tier package, the higher the guarantee is gonna be on the view. Sure. Uh, and then the other thing is uh, how fast, uh, you know, you've talked about this before, sort of a hockey stick and exponential growth. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about how fast some of these accounts grow? Yeah, uh, there's always outliers. It really follows the 80-20 rule to where 20% of the accounts can produce 80% of the results. And um, there is cases to where, you know, the second post on an account will get 3 million views and that account just takes off super fast right away. Other times it takes a little bit and uh, there's some testing that goes involved and maybe a month in or a month and a half in, it'll start to really take off. Mm. So there is a lot of variability in play as well. And it just goes back to what I was mentioning earlier of just stay consistent uh, post higher volume of quality content is key. A lot of people, they just don't post enough. Yeah. Uh, there's a huge thought, a school of thought out there uh, that you shouldn't be posting more than one video per day per account. And it's just false. It's not true. We've tested pretty extensively at this point of uh, posting between one video uh, to 12 videos per day per account. And we see best results between three to six videos per day. So if you're posting one time per day right now, three exit and you're not only going to experience more than three X growth, but probably more than that because yeah. every single one of those videos again has potential of being an outlier post, snowballing the whole process, getting a lot more views. And so if you three X your post, just from a linear standpoint, you should three X your views, three X your engagement, three yeah. X your growth, but then you'll have some that hit left and right as well. And then, so that will, you know, tap into inevitably even more growth than even three Xing just from the volume standpoint alone, as long as quality remains high. Right, you can't polish a turd. So if you're just, you know, throwing shit everywhere, posting crappy content, then it's not going to perform. Yeah, yeah. A lot of times I'm sitting there screaming on the microphone, thinking about like uh, Dylan, and and then we got to go, <laughs> got to go look through my shit. Yeah. Um, okay. So here we go. Uh, how do you? Ch so obviously you can't do this with anyone, right? They, mm -hmm. you, you already have people that have an established brand generally. And another thing you mentioned before, I think is really interesting. They probably need to have some kind of sales funnel. They need to have some way of, of. Um, capitalizing on their audience so that they can continue to, you know, fund this whole situation. So can you go into that, how you choose who your clients are? Yeah. So we can actually, we've rolled out more offers to be able to help people, whether they're just getting started or they already have an established following because we had so many people coming to us who didn't necessarily fit the criteria for yeah. the top level service, uh, who we're now able to help with different systems that we have in place to just tear it down from top up. But as far as our top level service and guarantee, we generally look for people that have uh, a million plus collective audience across the board and then 2 million plus in annual revenue. Mm. Uh, the revenue standpoint, because it shows us they have dialed acquisition systems and proven offers yeah. to where if we come in and we gain, let's say, 100 million new views in 90 days, it's hard to not make money from that process. Yeah. And, and you're going to see more leads come in and uh, whatever it is that you're doing to monetize um, but also not everyone has a sales funnel as well. We're working with other podcasts to where they more so monetize through AdSense, through brand sponsorship deals, sure. Patreon, et cetera. And so, uh, we can also still tap into, uh, making this enough meaningful growth, uh, to where it still dr drives an ROI if that's their way of yeah. monetizing. Yeah. That's that some kind of business model in order to turn that traffic right. into money right. to, to mm -hmm. monetize that. Like for us, like, I think something like 60% of our revenue was coming from organic. Mm -hmm. So our logic was if we double that organic number, we can double our revenue. And yeah. that's, uh, you know, mm -hmm. that's about what, you know, what we expect to do. So that's, mm -hmm. that's the reason why we ch chose to do it. But if mm -hmm. I didn't have the way to monetize on that audience, then it wouldn't work. Sure. Right? That's yeah, the, that's the main thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then I did mention, so a million plus collective audience, that's been a general rule of thumb, but really what we need the most is just a large content database to go off of. Yeah. So we're working with people also who don't necessarily hit that audience threshold 
but they do have enough content. Usually it's like 50 plus hours yeah. is the minimum that we want to see of edited content. So if that's the case, we can still come in and just amplify and explode and just flood socials with your content. On the scale of all your clients, the the number of minutes of video, how how where do I rank? The number of minutes of video, you're at the top. I am. <laughs> I, I was yeah. gonna say if there's somebody you with more than me, I would I need to know who this person is. Yeah. Yeah, I do nineteen hours of content per week. Uh, if yeah. you do all the stuff together, that's great. Yeah, You're I was a machine. Like, yeah, because no, I, I gave you guys two five thousand. So you, this is another I thing know. I want to talk about. This is something interesting that you do. You make Apple shared folders, and mm-hmm. you have the person go through all their entire, um, go through their entire photo uh, library mm-hmm. on their phone, and then then share that with you and and your producers. Yep. So we call it a camera roll dump, but what is everyone has iPhones usually, and so yeah. you'll create a shared album, send that to our team. And then just go through your photo album and find like the content that you like. It's we don't need it to only be professional, but also just travel, you with friends, yeah. family, whatever the case. And a lot of the time what you'll find is when we're looking through the camera roll album of our clients, uh, and they do these like camera roll dumps, you get to feel like you really know them as sure. a person and see more about what's uh than what's usually showcased on socials. Yeah. And we're using that as B roll and the content to still establish that type of personal relationship with the viewers as well. Yeah. And also it just helps to add a lot more variation for more creative B-roll. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily always need to be having a videographer, having a photographer uh, follow you around and stage content for your B-roll. Like you can use a lot of that personal side as well. And it works really well in your content. Um, I think I gave you guys, so you can only put 5,000 uh-huh. items in each one. And I've, I've gave you two 5,000 ones and I'm, I'm about to start the third one. <laughs> yeah. That's, they're they're monsters. It was yeah. a process transferring <laughs> them to Google drive. Yeah. But it, it's helpful for sure. Yeah. I mean, and the other thing I'll tell you from my standpoint, so mm-hmm. uh, thing I started doing the podcast, we didn't have any of this, like my podcast and MOA really weren't affiliated. They were sort of affiliated in mm-hmm. the beginning. Uh, and then later on, once we saw this was a great way for us to get leads to come down the, the pipe for the program, we started, uh, I started using the affiliating the podcast with men of action and then um when that happened we started having you know i used to do you know frequently three and four hour episodes Mm -hmm. and i was like man i have to go through these at double speed and then timestamp them and i was doing all the timestamps and then after the timestamps then i would make all the reels so i would do like two reels a week that was like the that was my capacity Uh then later on when we started doing it when we brought on char that it was like one reel a day like that when we got to one reel a day that was like a big deal Mm -hmm. then we started like two and then three reels a day and then we saw like the level at which other people were producing reels like with you guys Mm -hmm. just i know it's seems like a very little thing but have you ever seen where a guy says something like a punchline and then the camera like zooms in on his yep. face yep. but it's it's not a zoom in on the camera it's actually a digital zoom right, right. little things like that yep. and then and then all of a sudden you guys don't use stock footage you use footage of like celebrities yep. or whatever movie scenes movie scenes yep. stuff like that and and the level of production that you guys get because i every morning i wake up and i approve somewhere between nine and 18 videos a day mm. uh when dylan sends them to me and it's just really crazy like how much content you can actually you can produce yeah, you just need the right systems and yeah. then team to back it to where when we're doing these top level uh, packages as well, we usually have somewhere in the realm of four to 10 editors yeah. and involved. That's going to be like the heaviest uh, workload as far as the overhead side. Then we have one and two account managers, team leader. And overall, there's a team of 10 to 15 people backing yeah. this whole process and machine. And then we have great systems to back it up as well to make it all happen. But when you have those in place, yeah, you can do huge levels of volume. How do you do the time stamping? Do you guys have a guy who goes in there yeah. and search for the best stuff? How does that work? Yeah, that's called our clips coordinator role. Yeah. And they'll go through and just timestamp what they think is worthy shorts to be able to clip out of yeah. the content. And that improves the efficiency for our editors. Uh, our editors are generally doing two to six shorts per day, mm. depending on their time availability and also their efficiency. Uh, but that does help just uh, speed up the process for them to go into what we call our content database. All the videos are timestamped already and they can just click through. Every timestamp has like a caption essentially talking about what that timestamp is about yeah. as well. Um, so to speed up their process. I mean, I'm just curious because I would do it at like double speed or try to do it like four speed where I, or mm. th- triple speed where I'd listen to the podcast back and then try yeah. to timestamp it like that. <laughs> triple speed is next level. Yeah, so you, you can't do it on... Um, YouTube, you have to use a different app to do yeah. it, but you can do it on via VL, uh, VLC. You can do triple speed. Yeah. Um, anyway, so you that's really interesting. The other thing is uh, there were a couple other types of things that I've seen that will have worked really well. Mm. Uh, one of them, that, and I'm going to do this with you guys at some point in the future, but it is the man on the street videos, which okay. I'm, I'm going to yeah. try those. Adolfo Tex was on last week, and he has made a, he's made he's got 1.3 million followers on YouTube from 
from these videos where he basically does a workout, gets a pump, and then just walks up to women in the gym and just starts asking them questions with his Portuguese accent. Mm-hmm. Um, then the other type is uh, the gameplay videos, which I didn't understand at first, but like now I do. So you guys know it looks like the guy's playing some GTA race video yeah. or whatever uh-huh. and at the bottom and then the top, the video's going on, and that seems to work out pretty well too. If you ever watch Destiny's channel, Destiny mm-hmm. is like playing video games while he's doing a debate. Uh-huh. So that seems to be some, what, what, what is the, why does that work? Why do the gameplay ones work? <laughs> Man, it's, it's a funny thing. Um, I think it like, here's some theory behind it is people will like watch the clip and some people will watch the gameplay and be listening to the content, Yeah. but then maybe they miss some words because they get like mesmerized into the gameplay and they'll be like, wait, what did he say? And that it'll get them to like rewatch the content again to where they just maybe not be fully as focused on that one piece of the clip. And then also a lot of uh, people who make these secondary accounts or meme accounts as well, uh, just started doing that because it's a way to be able to go out, clip up content and do like very minimal editing yeah. um, when it has how it started. And then they'll just throw a game clip on the bottom half of it. And it's now a unique piece of content in the eyes of the algorithm. It'll be so, like some speed run from Sonic yeah. the Hedgehog or like it, some, some perfect like world record run that they'll put at the bottom. Mm-hmm. And then I, I also think it may be like, I feel like younger generations now have um, uh, problems focusing Mm. Right, some problems with ADD, uh, ADHD, and and so having that thing at the bottom sort of uh, it co- incapacitates them. So they yeah. they listen to what else is going on. Yeah. That's what I found myself doing, like uh-huh. li- like just watching. What is this down at the bottom? And then you end up listening to the whole thing, right. which is so fascinating to me. The the right. fact that you put gameplay on the bottom and then the things at the top, and I see those things going incredibly viral. I know it's it's really funny, but uh, it follows uh, one of the things that we train our editors on is following the two second rule to yes. where we want something visually engaging happening on the edit every two seconds. That's what you mentioned of the zoom effect is one example of that. You can do face tracking. We have less words on the screen at once with the captions to where it's like popping and changing much faster. There's a lot that, uh, that goes into that process. So gameplay plays into that as well to where there's something happening every second yeah. with the game to where it just it makes it more visually engaging also. Yeah. Um, and then I want to touch on the Man on the Street podcast, yeah. just like on the street uh, content in general. Oh my God, it performs well. Yeah. Like I, there's, I know people who have grown their following size from nothing to a million plus in less than six months just by doing on the street content. Yeah. I think uh, Mr. Beast popularized a lot of it to a degree. Like there's a lot of people who will go out with money. They're like, hey, for a hundred dollars, would you do this, et cetera. And they're getting some of the biggest views on the internet. So it works incredibly well. It's just uh, you need a videographer, someone to come out with you. It's more coordinated, but it's really, really uh, high performing content. Uh, sure. And then the last one I was gonna mention was the reaction videos. Uh-huh. So this is, yep. it used to be the reaction video I would see would be the guy up at the top reacting to the video at the bottom. Mm-hmm. But now what I've seen uh, they do now is that the, the video that they're reacting to is in the bottom quarter, mm-hmm. and then the top is the, the face of the person reacting. Uh, and then sometimes they'll stop the video in the middle and be like, oh, I'm doing this. Take, uh, yeah. uh, the, the, they do this a lot on Daily Wire. This is like they've yep. grown their platform a lot mm-hmm. from that. Well, reaction videos, why do those things to do so well? So um, one piece is that you can be strategic with what you're reacting to. And uh, I just started my personal brand fairly recently. I'm doing some reaction content on there. And my criteria for videos I'm reacting to is one, I want it to be on brand and something that I'm interested in actually talking about. Uh, but secondly is we are only choosing videos to react to that have already gone crazy viral. Yeah. So at minimum a million views, but a lot of them have done 10 million views, 15, 50 million views. And that becomes a part of your content as well. If it's proven to go that viral once, it gives it a higher likelihood of it going viral again. Yeah. And then also it is a seamless way to create content. You were mentioning when you're doing them, you can just like knock it out. Yeah. And that's a big part of content creation is removing friction doing something that feels seamless to you, that you enjoy like creating that type of content. So it's easy to do. It allows you to give your own take on it. Yeah. And usually when you're reacting to something, that is, in other words, giving your opinion on that thing. Yeah. People love opinions. They because do. You share your opinion. They want to share their opinion. People go in the comments, debate start, et cetera. Uh, especially the more polarizing that your opinion is or the more polarizing the video that you're reacting to is. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of factors that go into it, but I think it creates more of a community type vibe as well. Like people like watching TV together, watching yeah. movies together. And so it kind of has that aspect to it also. Yeah, I, I like it. So like when I film modules or when I do podcasts like this, I have to prepare. Mm-hmm. I don't have to prepare for reaction videos. Yeah. Like they yeah, just you want just your in. reaction. Uh, first day I did 26. The second day I did another 30. Mm-hmm. Uh, sent it to Dylan already. And I'm trying to do as many as I can every day. Because yeah. I want to awesome. see if this works. Like which one of these works, which one of these goes viral. Because sure. I'm really interested in that as well. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And then the other thing I want to ask you is uh, the difference between the platforms, right? Mm. There seems to be like, there's definitely a lot of things you can get away with on Instagram that you can on TikTok and definitely things that Instagram will promote that TikTok won't. Uh, so for instance, like for those of you who don't know on X, you can they just, they put like a not safe for work thing, but you can basically show nudity there. Whereas yeah. on yeah. Instagram, like you can get close to it. You'll see girls wearing sheer, uh, but they won't be completely nude. Whereas on Instagram, if you see a round girl's butt at all, that, that account is going to be gone. I don't know a single attractive girl who hasn't lost a TikTok, not one the, every yeah. single one of them. So TikTok seems to be a lot more strict when it comes to that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Also, um, I've noticed when, I don't know if you saw the other day, um, there was a, a video Kezia Noble did on my channel that was banned on TikTok but was totally fine on Instagram and it had to do with women liking really really crazy men like being attracted to crazy men okay I was like how is this flagging <laughs> the algorithm on TikTok uh, so it seems like TikTok seems to be the most finicky yep it's the most strict by far yeah and so if your content follows guidelines to where it can fly through TikTok then it's going to work on all platforms it's yeah totally fine. that's a really good way to look at it yeah yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and then um, on YouTube what I found is if you can get all of the controversial stuff out after the first 30 seconds, you'll even know, the, I, I first found out about this listening to um, uh, Impulsive. Okay. Uh, I noticed whenever there was profanity in the first 30 seconds, they'd bleep it out. I was like, oh, they're bleeping out everything because it's like a Disney show. And then and then after the first 30 seconds, you just hear F or F bombs. Interesting. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. And then later on, I heard him on a different uh, interview saying, yeah, in, uh, no, it was Bradley Martin saying, no, after the first 30 seconds, it's fine. I, I go to a first minute. Huh. If I say anything controversial, I'll cut it out of the first minute. I'll blink it out. And then afterwards, I don't really worry about that much. That's another thing I've noticed on YouTube. Also, YouTube seems to have loosened up the reins a bit because of rumble mm -hmm. so uh, youtube was basically there were a few narratives and i'm listen i don't think the election was stolen i like there's a few narratives that were out there that if you tried to push those narratives sure um yeah. you were going to get flagged on uh youtube and it's really funny because they would black they would get rid of that narrative but they let flat earth videos still be up there you know it was like one of these <laughs> right. it was like very weird how they chose what yeah, to i mean different agendas yeah. behind each one they don't get they ratio those flat earth videos there's a reason why i've kind of stopped doing the flat earth debates because uh -huh. every time i do one i'll like crush the guy and then i get no views because all <laughs> youtube cares about is that i did a, a debate on flat earth and yeah. they don't give a shit uh, but it's just one of these weird things where it's like um, it feels like uh, it, from their standpoint, once Rumble came out, and I don't know if you saw Rumble recently yeah. had the RNC on there, right? Okay. Once once they did that and they gave up this platform for more conservative content creators, yep. it felt like YouTube really loosened up the reins after that. Mm -hmm. And they put out some statements saying these topics that you couldn't talk about before, now you can talk about it. Have yep. you noticed you noticed a lot of these changes? Yes, definitely. I think the worst that it got as far as like pin swinging to one side of the pendulum was really in the thick of COVID, like 2020. Yeah. But yeah, it, was, sure. it was leading up to that in a huge degree of 2018, 2019, 2020, of the huge buildup. And so I think Rumble has played a role. I also think that just public sentiment, like there's a pendulum that always will swing back and sure. forth, right? And so I think we went too far to one extreme and yes. it's kind of starting to come back to the middle a little bit. Uh, there are a lot of people who are just completely fed up with so much uh, filtering on social platforms, especially when it came to more conservative content. Yeah. And it became a big topic of debate and just across media in general. So I think uh, all the social platforms started getting more flack on that as well. And we've seen uh, it ease up more across the board, I would say, if you're comparing to like 2020, yeah. it was really the height. It's funny because, uh, you know, there were certain people trying to act as if big tech weren't completely on one side of the political yeah, aisle. Uh -huh. And then they all ban Andrew Tate on the same day. I text mm. him the day it happened. Mm. Everything. He, he couldn't catch an Uber that day. Every one of those apps was taken Crazy. off his phone the day that it happened. Wow. So you want us to believe that there's not collusion. Right. <laughs> but all of he loses everything on the same day. Does that seem and then um, and then the further collusion, I just finished Elon Musk's book yesterday. Amazing. Yeah. And I read it fantastic. Well. Yeah. But do you remember the part where he goes into the Twitter files and uh -huh. his attorney uh, and also Jack Dorsey, they admit later on, yes, this whole thing where we didn't want to produce stories about or didn't want to allow stories about the um, the Biden laptop. Mm -hmm. Um he's like, We we regret doing that. But it yep. turns out it's like this is the worst kept secret in all of media is the fact that like one side of the aisle is being represented and being uh, the algorithm is rewarding it and the other side isn't and it's just really interesting how it's different on different platforms yeah and now there's a huge concern of that translating to ai as well yeah chat gpt and all yeah. the different platforms but i mean if you look at the h uh, the headquarters of where all these platforms are based it's silicon valley yeah for sure and uh i mean the culture there is far left yeah now uh elon when he was on joe rogan's podcast most recently he was talking about how he felt like like buying Twitter for, for his methodology was a big part of saving the world and saving media. Cause he saw like he calls it the woke mind virus. Yeah. 
taken over. And, and the analogy he uses, if you go to San Francisco and you look, it just, it's, it's not looking good. It's looking yeah. in shambles. And that's what that type of mindset creates uh, yeah. is essentially the analogy that he was using. Um, and so, yeah, he, I mean, he's gone in and they found proof of that through Twitter files and there's, there's, it's just factual at this point. There's not even theory behind it. The, the, the issue was like, uh, so Gad Sad wrote a book called the, the parasitic mind. And okay. he, it's more of a scientific description of what he talks about the mo woke mind virus. Mm. Uh, and he's right. Like it is one of these situations where things went too extreme to one direction. Yeah. They went too extreme mm -hmm. to another. Like for instance, I think that that fam those families had the right to sue Alex Jones, but I also think Alex Jones should be like the platform from every single platform. Like mm -hmm. I think both things can be true. Sure. Right. Uh, the same thing. Like uh, you know, uh, each platform has the right to to change. You know, and allow people to come on, but you should give them the opportunity to take the post down. That's another thing. Mm -hmm. I had one of my accounts taken down. There were some white nationalists who started attacking me and like mm -hmm. making physical threats against me. So I made threats against them nothing happened to their account my account was completely deleted on x really? it's one of the crazy i still have screenshots of it if i ever e meet elon musk i'm going to show him i'll be like bro <laughs> you let a bunch of li i'm not kidding literal yeah. nazis get re get get my account taken down mm. and it was just like one of the craziest things i'd ever seen and that's one of the funny things that i noticed and maybe you, you've seen this too is that the more anonymity on the platform the more hateful the stuff gets meaning mm. i find the least hateful comments on instagram because people tend to use Instagram to show their life and there's not a ton of anonymity. I find the most hateful stuff on TikTok and, and X because those a lot of times on X, like they're, they don't have any affiliation to who they are as a real person. Mm -hmm. They're just like trolls. I don't know if you've, you've seen something similar. I, I, I see a lot of hate across the board on all really? the platforms. Yeah, I, re I so. really don't get much on Instagram. I don't know why. It just it, yeah, for, for your personal brand, yeah. it makes sense. But just across the accounts and you see a lot of posts that go viral, it's, it, you don't get away from it. You know? yeah. and it's, everyone has different opinions. You know? it, it just comes down to just how we're wired. Some people are allergic to the eating peanuts. Others are not. Same yeah. thing uh, goes to views and opinions. So no matter who you are and what you talk about, what you do, you're not going to make everyone happy. Yeah. And uh, especially if it's a more polarizing piece of content, it's going to go out. There's going to be people who like it and there's going to be people who don't. And y you'll see that hate across the board. Have you yeah. seen, this is totally off the subject, but have you seen there's this new strategy and it's usually gym bros who are doing this. Mm. They'll go on to random people's, um, IGs and they'll just comment whatever bro or calm down or something like that. Yeah. You, have you seen this before? Yeah. So that you go back and like you just try to bash these people. Have you yeah. seen it? Like they just they aren't even reading your stuff. They're just leaving an insult comment and then they're dipping. Have you seen this? Yeah. So we have had some editors in our company. We call it our dark comment strategy. Yeah. But they'll just go and comment on a video and just say something completely opposite to start some controversy yeah. in the comments. And it always sparks debate and just gets more people commenting yeah. and that helps the video perform. So, But by the way, any, if this is a free tip for anybody out there. You guys want a ton of free comments. All you have to do is this. Ready? Say anything bad about Russia. Just say anything bad about <laughs> Russia. You will get hundreds and hundreds of comments that are, that are like these accounts. I don't know if they originate in Russia or if Russia's paying them or whatever. And they just say utter and complete nonsense. And they'll sit there. Like, it's really crazy how Russia has this apparatus built. Again, I don't, I don't mind if you're pro. I'm not talking about pro Ukraine or pro Russia. They're mm -hmm. just saying stuff that is isn't true and that's one of the craziest things i've seen like if you guys want free try it we'll go out there make a video make a clip be like yeah i think it's weird that russia's kim's missile got shot down and then they lost their flagship in the uh black sea i think that watch that what uh post that and then watch the comments that come in it's madness bro. you'll get hundreds of comments and they'll just say crazy stuff um the thing I want to ask you about is your software stack. So for okay. your business, mm -hmm. well, actually, let's go back to the beginning. So Spencer sure. was working with Im Iman Ghazi. Correct. Okay. Uh -huh. And then wh how did, wh you know, actually, let's go back further than that. Okay. You, were, you were a previous entrepreneur in several other ventures. What did you do before this? So I started in the digital marketing agency space uh, when I was 18 years old and had no idea what I was doing for the first three years. Um, ended up working for someone and within about three, four months, uh, learned his entire business and was essentially running his agency, learned how to prove results. And it was more so geared towards working with local businesses. But I invested in a lot of programs, masterminds, communities at that point through mutual connections is actually uh, Jason Capital, who my partner Spencer Murphy was working yeah. with. Um, Jason, I, I got connected with him and then he got connected with Manny Koshbin, who is known for his incredible car collections, world class. Uh, he's got Bugatti, uh, Bugatti's, Pagani's, McLaren's, et cetera. And he made his money, Manny Koshman made his money in commercial real estate. He was looking for someone to come to help him build and scale his coaching company, teaching others how to invest in commercial real estate. So I ended up getting connected with Manny. I had always wanted to get into real estate and ended up taking that opportunity. 
it was an incredible experience. Uh, he was an amazing mentor. And that pulled me from Texas to California, worked directly with him for over two years, just building that company for him. And that was really my big uh, purview, getting into the personal brand space, learning what it's like to be on the backside of having a large audience and building the coaching company, building personal brand, having info products, masterminds, events, et cetera. Um, and gave me incredible experience, also connected me to a lot of people in the industry. And then uh, in the same time, my partner, Spencer, he was working with Jason Capital, I believe as his head of marketing, started with uh, Jason when he had somewhere in the realm of like 30 to 50,000 collected followers on platforms. And over the course of the next four years, they scaled it to more than 6.6 .6 million followers mm. collectively. Um, and after working with Jason, Spencer got connected with Iman Godzi. This was after Andrew Tate had blown up and went from, yeah. you know, fairly unknown to the most Google person on the planet in less than five months by using this strategy. And so Iman was looking to build and run and scale the Andrew Tate model in house, which is why uh, he hired Spencer. Spencer was able to take, uh, prior to working with Iman, they had done multiple months of hundred million plus views with Jason. Um, so he already had a lot of systems in place that he was able to apply and use that to really pioneer and lead the entire division of building out that entire strategy for Iman. Uh, and ran that, worked with him for about eight months and just, they absolutely crushed results. If you go back and look at Social Blade, uh, Spencer started with Iman and I believe July of 2022 and you just see the growth chart, an immediate spike and it's uh, remained ever since, since they incorporated this whole secondary account network and short form strategy. So um, he, Spencer was at my house and he was telling me, this was when he was still working with Iman, that in the first five months, they had generated more than 600 million views. I was like, wait, what? Like how many views? Uh, I was shocked by it because it's just a massive number. Uh, and it stuck in my head. I was at a point to where I was ready to pivot. And then Spencer was also wanting to uh, just go back out on his own, start an agency. So timing worked out between both of us. And uh, we came up with the idea of let's start at the top in our small bubble of personal brands, but um, let's offer a huge guarantee of hundred million views in 90 days guarantee. We've since increased it to 150 million views. Yeah. Um, and let's go to the top. We made a, what we call our dream 1000 list of all the top brands and names that we'd want to work with. Uh, and then just had a VA go scrape all their emails, find their contact. Uh, we also had enough connections in the industry at that point to where we had uh, people we could lean on for, for, for referral partners as well. And that's what we did to jumpstart the company. Um, and immediately the, like Grego Gallagher was our first client and started signing uh, more bigger names soon after and was able to work with a lot of people who already had an incredible following and incredible foundation. And we were just able to come in and amplify it further. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of like the Tesla strategy to where they started with the roadster, went after the highest end clientele, built a lot of hype, like helped build their brand. And uh, a lot of people wanted to be a part of that and then use that to scale and really go horizontal down market uh, to where now they have the model three that's extremely affordable and yeah. that's the vision for Elon to make it affordable for anyone. Uh, that's kind of the same process that we followed of starting at the top. Uh, now we're starting to roll out different offers to where we can help more people in all assets and verticals just scale their socials online. And it's uh, been an amazing journey and experience so far. Uh, you, you mentioned this on, on other podcasts where you mm -hmm. talk about scaling and licensing. Uh -huh. So scaling is something uh, a, a lot of people think, well, you want to do twice as much business. You just hire twice as many people, but mm -hmm. you have to train those people and you mm -hmm. have to QC to make sure that they're qualified for what you want. And it, when you double the size of the sales team, it's not twice as hard. It's more than twice as hard. Yep. Can you go over that? There's been some, you mentioned before, there's been some difficulties when it comes to scaling and, you, and the possibility of you guys licensing these mm -hmm. ideas. Yes. So when it comes to scaling, it's uh, with this model specifically, I mentioned earlier, it's a team of 10 to 15 people to offer and really run this entire system of the top level service. So there's a lot of operational complexity. And as you scale, I mean, we went from starting the company to, uh, I believe we were at 50 people within somewhere in the course of like eight months of the company. Um, so we scaled to a, a fairly big team pretty quickly and you start to need to bring in additional layers of management to be able to handle all that operational capacity. And with our type of model on just the top level done for you, if we were to double our business, we essentially needed to almost double the team size. Um, so there's a lot that goes into that. It's not something that happens overnight. Like you mentioned, you need, I mean, we've continued to build incredible training in place, better fulfillment systems, yeah. uh, just getting better and better at the hiring process, skills assessments. Like we've hired a lot of people and are continuing to hire a lot of people. Um, we have high standards for 
um, the entire company. We're very dialed on our core values and building the culture. And so um, a lot of that has, has built a strong culture of A players, of top level mentalities or core values or greatness, integrity, creativity. And so um, we use all of this as components to just identify top level people mm. on the front end, which helps move the needle for the company. Um, so all those facets, they, they tie into this together. But we're to the point now to where we're really going into 2024, focused on building out uh, our executive team and also hiring more directors, bringing mm. them into the company. Uh, so we just hired a sales manager and he has incredible experience, uh, which is a big piece of this is like, uh, instead of putting all the time and going through the process and learning how to build a sales team yourself, let's go out and hire a sales manager or sales director who's already done it three, four, five times and done it extremely successfully. So like the sales manager we just hired has decades of experience, uh, many of which are in like online high ticket coaching. Uh, his recent um, company, he built the sales team from scratch and the Hermoses came in and that's one of their portfolio companies now. So it shows a lot of proof in the concept. So you can really just reverse engineer and look at the experience of people bring in expertise. We're looking to uh, place a COO later this year in Q2, we're going to place a director of marketing. Um, so it's a, a very big who, not how approach of yeah. just bringing in the right people to pioneer all these areas. And then we can just work through them. And, and I want people coming on board who is telling us what to do based on their expertise, yeah. way smarter, way more experienced than we are. Right. Um, and then going to the licensing question, uh, that is something that is now available. We're offering to people to just be able to scale and help more people. Uh, to where we are just giving essentially the entire business of all of our IP, our systems. We've made everything as plug and play as possible, training that goes along with it to where you can come in and uh, just get access to it. And our team will be there to hold your hand, answer your questions each step of the way to implement the entire secondary system yourself um, as a done with you approach rather than a done for you approach. So that is an offer that we've rolled out as well to just be able to scale this and, and help more people run it. Uh, your software stack. So I don't know if you saw today, Alex Ramosi made a huge investment in school. I did see that. Uh, we oh. use school. Uh, it's really interesting. There are some advantages and disadvantages compared to, um, what am I thinking of, Discord. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can you, you can have paid and free in, in one Discord channel, whereas Zoom you, or school, you have to have more than one. But man, school has like some awesome gamification to it. I don't know if you've used it yet before, but there's mm -hmm. like, one of the reasons why we liked it was because it was almost a combination of Discord and Kajabi. We could put them together yep. so we could have the modules in with the, you know, the message boards. Mm -hmm. um, you guys have a software stack. I had Alex uh, Neist on here. He's the guy from uh, Hot Stitch Tape, and he was explaining okay. his, his yeah. software stack. Mm -hmm. Yours is very similar to ours. Can you go over your software stack, all the software you use in order to, to run your business? Yeah, so a lot of it is built through Google, just Google Workspace, Google, Sheets, Google Docs, yeah. Google Sheets. Yeah. Google Sheets are incredible. Yeah. And then we have a data analyst on our team who he just does things with Sheets I didn't know was possible. Like yeah. they're, they're amazing. Um, so that's become a huge asset for the company where a lot of it is tied around. Notion is incredible as well. I've yeah. used a lot of the different project management softwares like ClickUp and Asana. And Notion is by far my favorite from a product project management standpoint, but also from just building out your company assets, SOPs, a bit SOPs are standard operating procedures, just basically checklists of how yeah. things get done. And uh, a big pain point of that for me prior to working with Notion was just the organization behind it and making it easy to navigate to if yeah. you had like a question come up understanding like how do you do this thing where do you go uh notion makes it just like super easy to organize everything and navigate to the right the correct spots yeah uh, which has been very helpful as well and then um, slack is our communication tools on zoom all the time uh, we have the api scraper is something that our team has built internal um, that we're using to track all of our results and we have very very detailed tracking dashboards uh, of how we're just uh, processing and, and tracking all the analytics and uh, have done like billions of views, 180,000 plus posts at this point. Yeah. And uh, the, the granular tracking that we have through the APIs has allowed us to really learn through that process what works and what doesn't. So we can lean in more to what works. Um, outside of that. I mean, we all use Zoom. Oh, yeah, you use, Zoom. use Loom with your notion? Oh yeah, Loom is huge. Loom saves so much time. So uh, Loom will create that with, uh, we'll use Loom for SOPs, we'll mm -hmm. use it for sales proposals, and then also just internally, instead of hopping on a meeting when uh, team members have different questions or we need to explain something to people, we'll just record a quick Loom video, yeah. 30 seconds, one minute. Uh, that used to require people scheduling like a 30 minute meeting to go. Over yeah, just wasting so much so time. So making videos like that, you used to have to do them on OBS and like yeah, you would put uh -huh. your face down yeah. at the bottom. Loom makes it so easy. Like I, I, uh, I was trying to teach 
uh, guy how to do my invites. So I like I needed a mass invite. I need this guy to invite four thousand people, and he mm -hmm. was logged into my IG to do it. And and I was like, man, I, I hate writing out these SOPs. And then Grant showed me Loom, where it's my voice, but he's watching the button pushing that I'm right. doing, yep. and it was incredible. And I so I sat there and I did invites for thirty minutes just so this guy had no freaking questions. He said, yeah, I watched it. I knew exactly what to do afterwards. Yeah. Loom is so great for like passing down mm -hmm. instruction to yep. people that then can go back and refer to. So that that is really uh, incredible. I'm still trying to figure out Notion. I, I, I got to be honest with <laughs> you. There's a learning curve too. There, there definitely is. Uh, as far as Slack, I yeah. use Slack every day, all the time, and I still don't completely understand it. Like I'm just like, <laughs> you can run a workflow and then a thing happens. And oh then, yeah, yeah. There, there's yeah. more features that we don't tap into yeah. or scratch the surface on as well. I mean, yeah. they're constantly adding updates to it, but uh, it's still it's still a great tool. Yes, and then also uh, when you uh, and then also for for those of you and by the way I'm bringing this up because I know there's a lot of entrepreneurs that watch this show and you kind of want an idea. When I heard this, mm -hmm. I was I was very encouraged because that's all the stuff we do. We never had a conversation about yeah. this. Mm -hmm. Frame.io, obviously, yep. we're constantly making we make our own ads, mm -hmm. uh, and I'll go in there and often it'll be like, hey, this girl right here is married and doesn't want to be in this video. This mm -hmm. girl right here, blah yep. blah blah. This person needs to be removed, blah blah blah, that kind of stuff. And I use Frame.io mm -hmm. uh, in order to do that, and we'll send those messages just back and forth on Slack. I yeah, know you guys use I'm, that. I'm glad you brought that up. I was I, uh, missing that one. But frame.io is what we use for, you mentioned QC is quality control. We also call it QA, quality assurance, but it's just reviewing content. Yeah. And it makes it so easy to leave edits and revision notes. You can like draw on it. You can have arrows pointing. You can leave timestamps or like highlight a specific portion of the video uh, of the note that you're leaving. So um, it makes it incredibly more efficient to do that versus like, just manually typing out a timestamp with like a Google Drive video. Isn't it incredible if you think about like 10 years ago, like the amount of productivity you can get with very simple apps now? Oh yeah. It's just incredible. Like mm -hmm. when you really think about how much communication goes through our Slack channels, I'm sure yours are just like mine. Yep. It's like crazy. Uh, and, and the fact that it's a, it's a software that isn't that expensive mm -hmm. and the fact that we can gather a community in our circle or our discord or our telegram or whatever. And most of these things are like free or close to free. That's, that's really amazing. Google sheets, totally free mm -hmm. stuff like that is, is really amazing when you realize it. Uh, the other thing is building your funnels. You said you've built several funnels before. This is something mm -hmm. that's fascinating to me. Um, uh, building any kind of system like this is fascinating mm -hmm. to me. Uh, you use Wix and use click funnels. Can you talk so about we've, that? So we've actually migrated over um, and everything is now set in go high level. But yeah, okay. I've, I've built hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of funnels at this point. Uh, go high level is an incredible all-in-one tool to do this. Yeah. Um, I have like made a lot of funnels with click funnels in the past. And then with click funnels, we need to enter, integrate a separate CRM. And then yeah. we also need to integrate like active campaign or another email service provider. And then a separate tool for sending text and like the, the software stack never ends. and uh, the more that you tie together, the more expensive it becomes. Also, the more room for error there is. So uh, we have just integrated everything together with Go High Level. It makes it super simple. Our funnels are built there. Our website is built there. You can track everything. Uh, we have UTM parameters is um, just something that you can add to the end of your links for source tracking and campaign tracking to understand where traffic is coming through from. That's all imported into Go High Level. It's our CRM that our sales team use. And then there's a lot of automations that you can build out. They make it just stupid simple to uh, create an automation to where, let's say that someone opts in on this uh, funnel, this text goes out and then this email goes out and this voicemail drop goes out and this task is created and a manual call connect is sent and so on and so forth. Um, and so, yeah, I didn't touch on the sales uh, software side, but go high level is a huge, huge lever. It's an incredible CRM. They've made it super uh, stupid, simple for especially people like, more so beginning and getting started to yeah. use, but you can still take it to a very high expert level. And then outbound dialing is huge when building a sales team and a sales force. You're talking um, about for your setters, just the outbound dialing yeah. apps. I didn't even know what that was until the other day. And then I saw my, uh, Rashad, one of our guys, did 486 outbound dials yeah. in one day. I was oh, like, how, how is that possible, bro? Yeah, yeah. That's incredible. Yeah, so that's uh, through a power dialer. Um, yeah. yeah, your team is on it. And so we use another software that integrates natively with Go High Level called Allaware. Yeah. And it is uh, a really great just outbound um cold calling software, uh, the power dialer makes it super e easy for the sales reps to just upload a list and then it just starts dialing one by one by one. We double dial everyone. If you call someone twice, it's more likely that they're gonna pick up. Yeah. Um, and so it'll just automate that process. If they don't answer, it'll move on to the next person. If they don't answer, an automation can happen to where it automatically sends a text. Like it improves efficiency a lot across the board. Um, and we speed to lead is a huge 
uh, incredible component. It's very important to where there's a lot of studies that have been done on this from Harvard Business Review, HubSpot, et cetera, that shows if you contact a lead within five minutes of coming through your system uh, versus after five minutes, there's yeah. a significant, it's like 200% drop off in response after that five minute window. Because when they're coming through, they're showing you that they're available, you're top of mind for them, like they're focusing on whatever it is that you're doing, right? And so um, we have good systems in place to just optimize that process of someone coming through the system, like the team is on it and yeah. they're getting notifications. All they do is click a button and you're it's immediately calling them. Um, so these tools are incredible. It, it, isn't, aren't these tools, like when you think about it, if you had to start a business that had nothing to do with what we're doing, like if you weren't doing the, mm -hmm. you know, social media engagement and I wasn't teaching people how to build social circles, I just feel like we could build other businesses so easy because these oh, yeah. pieces, uh -huh. just the level of leverage that you get from these, these softwares right. are incredible. Right. Like compared to things like, Twin, like so much is eliminated. And then, so on the one hand, it's like the potential is limitless. And then on the other hand, it's like, what if AI just comes and wipes all of this out, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's gonna help maximize uh, and just bring even more out of it at first. And then at some point, maybe it's three years, maybe it's 10 years, it's just gonna take over to where there's no human involvement needed. Yeah, it's funny. We were talking about, uh, I was talking with my team, I was like, what, what about AI setters? And they're like, yeah, pretty soon we're gonna have AI yeah, setters. And yeah. I'm like, we're really? Close. We're very close. Isn't that crazy? Uh -huh. You think about that? Yeah, it's insane. I mean, the, like, just salespeople yeah. in general is a massive, massive industry. And I think that we're in the course of maybe a few years out maximum from replacing the need for at least over the phone sales, like in-person sales is there, Zoom plays a big role, um, but just over the phone sales, it's getting close. Like yeah. they're, they're getting scary good. Um, the leading, like a big one is Air AI right now. And I've tested it a lot and I'm continuing to keep an eye on it. And there's a, a lag, uh, like the a latency of just like it responding to you. And yeah. some of the responses still sound a little AI and like robotic, um, but it does an incredible job of handling objections. Like I put it to the test and uh, it was doing just a great job, like keeping me on the phone and yeah. it's only gonna get better at an exponential rate. So we're really not far off from it. And it's just crazy to see that come out of nowhere. And it's just continuing to happen in every single industry as well. So. AI is something that is, uh, it's, it's going to be really interesting. I think it's, um, really going to take over most human involvement o over the course of the, like the next decade or so. And then it'll be interesting to see how we play into that. Do you remember, uh, when they were going over in Elon's book about mm -hmm. the, the AI sort of competition between these yep. different companies. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, uh, this one group, uh, maybe it was open AI that, that went to Bill Gates and Bill Gates said, this is fine, but it needs, I bring me back something that can pass a biology uh, college placement test. Mm -hmm. And he goes, I, that'll probably take him a couple years to figure this out. Yeah. He said these, these people were back in two months yeah. with a test that just blew it away. And he was like totally blown away by it. So yeah, that is, that is something interesting, like how far that's gone and how quick it's happening. And like the, uh, Neil Patel, I think said it for the best is like, people are overestimating what it can do now and underestimating what it's going to do in the future Yeah, with artificial intelligence. Yeah. That's pretty on point. Yeah. I'd say. Um, so, uh, hiring, that's another thing I want to mm -hmm. ask about uh, just, from, uh, you know, we've, it's one of the situations where we have, we had 800 people apply to be salespeople for us. And mm, we probably, uh, we probably had 1% we've hired. Yeah. What, and it's then great. I, you know, I think about, um, the pools here during the summer and uh, this mm. is January, the winter's here, like 8,000 girls come to Las Vegas to try out for the pool jobs. Mm. And I'm just like, man, how do you pick which ones you hire? This is crazy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, your hiring techniques. What do you, mm. how do you choose uh, who to hire? Yeah. Uh, the more experience I've gotten in this realm, the more I like to go off of experience as well, but it depends on the role, right? So yeah. when it comes to our secondary network and that system, this is something that's unique to us. No one else in the marketplace knows how to do it. Um, to our knowledge that we've connected with, especially taking it, uh, as the agency model. And so no one's going to have like direct line experience with that. We just need to train them up on that process. So for that, we can hire more off of traits, right. And just culture fit. Um, but then other positions, experience plays a huge, huge role, especially when you get to more of a management level, director level, executive level. Um, when you start to get to like director and executive, you want people whose experience far outweighs yours. Yeah. Um, and then the more directly aligned it is with your industry as well, the better it's going to be. We're still in a bubble of like this digital marketing space. It's overall a small industry yeah. compared to just business in general. Um, and so it is also very different. I think that we are definitely ahead of the curve in a lot of the ways with the technology that we use, the terminology is different, et cetera. It's its own industry. And so I like to find people who have experience for our company 
when it comes to uh, like online digital marketing agency services and also online high ticket sales as well. Um, and the more direct it is and the longer that stint of experience is, the better qualified that candidate is going to be. Yeah. Uh, we have skills assessments that we have set up for all of our roles. Um, and it can be just fully custom tailored to what is this person going to be doing in the day to day? Mm. And then create an assessment around that. Okay. So you get a taste of how are they actually going to work? Uh, we also make them pretty detailed step by step. And we want people to like get it perfect. Yeah. If there's any mistake, we don't hire that person because immediately that just shows lack of attention to detail. Mm. And that's going to be a bigger problem down the road. Uh, and then um, we also have them doing personality assessments. Our favorite is Myers-Briggs, but there's a lot. We, we have them do Myers-Briggs. They also do a DISC assessment. Um, I've heard Culture Index is incredible, but we haven't looked into so, that one yet. So, so I've looked up the science on this, mm -hmm. and the Myers-Briggs thing isn't really predictive of anything except this. What we found is our top sales guys will test, and then we'll have other guys sit a test, and they end up being our top sales guys too when they have similar personality profiles. Mm. That is something we found. We found something as far as similarities it's concerned, but I've, I've read like the Myers-Briggs thing. I don't even think they teach it in business school anymore. Uh, it's, it's like one of these things where when they actually put it to the test, it didn't really stand up. Mm. But what, what happened was when you took your top performers and you gave them personality tests, mm -hmm. if you found people that were similar, then you would find like similar results. So it's a kind of an interesting way. That's, we, that's how we're using personality tests. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how we're using those assessments for our hiring process. Nice. Yeah, we found a similar um, like pattern there as well with a lot of the top performers in our company and everyone is fairly similar yeah. uh, on the myers break. So uh, we like to just find more people who kind of fit into that bucket as well. Mm -hmm. And then also when it comes back to the hiring question, it depends on the level of the role. You can really get an organization as T1, T2, T3, like tier one, tier two, tier three. Yeah. In the sense of like top level executive down to management, down to just the uh, boots on the ground, like really uh, doing that front end work. And um, on the tier two and tier three level, you really want to just incentivize through your payment structure. And so there's really three categories to payment. You have the base slash salary, and then you have a commission as far as either rev share or profit share, and then you have bonuses as well. And so you can set up a uh, base and then give them some level of commission for sales, it's usually more so revenue share yeah. for like back end operations, whatever marketing, it could be more profit share because you want to incentivize that. Sure. But if you only focus on that, you can over incentivize the need for profit to where sometimes people will uh, optimize things for short term profit yes. rather than what's best long term for yeah. the company as well. So that's when you can cadence in bonuses for specific longer term targets also and like quarterly targets, one year targets, three year targets. Yeah. Uh, and you can just be very strategic through the payment structure that you set up uh, to properly align incentives about what you really want yeah. to accomplish, right? Yeah. So there's there's a lot of material courses uh, just taught on that alone, but it's a big lever that you can pull. And then through the hiring process, um, just like to ask questions to get a better idea of why are they looking for a new position? Um, what Why are they not in their previous role? Uh, what is their why or questions I like to ask, yeah. like their three year vision in our space. A lot of people want to come and they're like, I want to start my own company in three years. We don't generally hire them. <laughs> we don't want people who want to like come in, learn this process, start their own company. Yeah. We want a lot of longevity with our team. Yeah. Um, so all those play roles, but uh, the experience is a big one, especially with sales as well, is the more experienced your salespeople are coming into those positions, the better they're going to be from the start. Yeah. Uh, let's go back to this, the strategies that you've seen online for, so for instance, for some of your clients, mm -hmm. uh, we, we've, we've gone over a few of them. Are there any other strategies that you've seen work well? Uh, there was one we didn't mention, which was Bradley does this, which is direct to camera. He's just talking yep. the, uh -huh. the Hermosi style videos. Yeah, talking head is what we call talking it. head. Yep. Can you go over like, what are the strategies? Somebody's watching this right now. And I'm, I was going to go over this cause you have a lot of free resources that you give out for uh -huh. people who kind of want to learn about, uh, you have viral, um, viral topics that people can do reaction yeah, videos yeah. on, viral that's, hooks. That's our uh, free mini course. It's called 2 Billion View Secrets, just yeah. breaking down. Uh, it's like we put some of our best stuff in there. It's yeah. really, really good. Um, we have hundreds of what we call our viral hook frameworks that you can use to tailor around the hooks for your content. It gives you content topic ideas. We have our posting scheduler in there. A lot of trainings that we've learned on the editing side and clipping up long form. It's really good resource. It's an hour and a half of just like a pack full of value. Feedback on it's been incredible. Um, that is at go.mediascaling.com forward slash secrets. Um, so what, 
Yeah, you know, what, what are some of the strategies that you've seen? Somebody wants oh. to get started in mm -hmm. this right now. Maybe they can't afford to hire a team, you know what I'm saying, of 40 editors to help yeah. them out. What, uh, what, what strategies do you think work the best? As far as just getting started with content yeah. creation. Um, so it goes back to, you want to remove friction. And yeah. so you want to have some uh, layer of content creation that works for you. Mm. You mentioned OBS earlier, which is great. Uh, I'm on Zoom calls all the time yeah. through internal meetings, sales calls, et cetera. And if you, production quality does matter. So yeah. you want a good camera, you want good lighting, you want a good microphone, et cetera. If you are just like using an old MacBook, the video is pixelated, the lighting is horrible, your face is all dark, it's an echoey mic, like that content is not gonna perform. Uh, but if you have a professional equipment set up where you're at your desk doing Zoom calls, one, it makes an incredible impression on people yeah. and really helps with your calls. But two, you can also turn your calls into content using OBS. Yeah. Um, so you can have it record your, your calls and keep that top production quality. And then it immediately syncs to your Google Drive and your team can come in and take over the rest. Yeah. So that's one great example of removing friction, right? Then turning that process into content and you spend no additional time to do that. Podcast is another thing that it just, it's fun to do. You make great connections. Uh, and it just feels very fluid. Like it doesn't feel like it's it, it's work when it, you're doing a it podcast. Feel, like. It feels like the algorithm gives me a little bit of a break because there's a microphone in front of me. I feel mm. like the algorithm, like it was something I noticed uh, because, you know, when I first started on TikTok, it was a bunch of lifestyle videos, which got me banned pretty quick. And then <laughs> well, on my, with your lifestyle yeah. on that platform. Yeah. <laughs> uh, then we would do, then some of my female friends, they would show, you know, they'd be in bikinis or whatever. And yeah. then their, their accounts got banned pretty quick. And then I decided, okay, let's make a TikTok, but it's only going to be clips from my podcast. And I had one clip in the first week with 15 million views and another wow, one with 8 yeah. million. Yeah, it was, it was crazy what happened initially, but it just, it felt like I got a lot more leeway from TikTok when they uh -huh. saw a microphone in front of me. Yeah. They I wanted mean, that kind of content. It's also like not a bunch of girls at bikini yeah. competitions and stuff as well. Which is, let's stop course. discriminating. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't understand. Well, like more of that. Uh, yeah. yeah, so so that, so that what are the things that you see that are working the best? Yeah, so going back to starting, um, one that a lot of people make the mistake on is just being ad hoc with their content creation mm. and not having their uh, the proper preparation going into it yeah. to where it's like, they try and get a video out a day and it's like every day they're like, oh, what should I talk about? I need to film a quick video, et cetera versus you can batch all of your content. So you can put in your calendar, let's say a three hour window, and then just prepare before that batch filming session of what you're going to be talking about. If you're gonna do reaction content, um, it depends on what level that you're at. I'm a huge believer in who not how and delegating out. And a lot yeah. of this stuff is easy to delegate. You can go on Upwork and find a VA, which stands for virtual assistant, and pay in the realms of three, $4 an hour for a lot of these tasks such as finding reaction content. If that's what you wanna do, they can put together a database of content for you to react to. Uh, and then when you're ready to go, you just schedule out three hours in your, your calendar and your schedule. Uh, what I also recommend to just skip back for a second is have a studio set up uh, in an area that makes it super easy for you to film. Like for me, my office is in my house and I've also turned that into my studio as well. So when I'm ready to film, all I have to do is walk downstairs, go in my office and press record everything's already set up versus needing to coordinate with the videographer, needing to coordinate and like go to a studio or go to this different environment, et cetera. So you can film all your content in the same setting in the same place. Yeah. And then when you have your own studio set up, um, it just makes it very seamless and frictionless. And it's also, you can ensure quality. Um, I have everything set up on like smart plugs as well to where it's like, I press a button on my phone and the whole studio turns on. Oh wow. Uh, one. So it's like, you can systemize this stuff. Um, and once you have that studio set up, especially if you have a spot to where you can do this in your home, uh, it's best to have a camera and a mic and et cetera. But if you are more so starting on a budget, you can use a phone. Uh, you should put it on a tripod and then just sit in front of a window, window where the lighting isn't bad. Like don't have a mess behind you in the background. The backdrop matters as well. But it's small things that you can do to systemize this process and then batch your content filming instead of being ad hoc, like once per day, like scrambling, trying to film the video and then using CapCut and editing it yourself and then posting it out. Next thing you know, one video took an hour. Instead, if you have the systems in place, this is really our uh, entry level program called Short Form Mastery. We give them our systems for, there's really three pillars we've broken it down into of production, then editing and the distribution, right? So the production is the filming of the content, editing is editing it, and then distribution is account management and actually posting it out. Mm. You should focus in on the production you should not be doing the editing. You should not be doing the distribution. Yeah. Otherwise, you're going to give yourself a full-time job and it's going to become just, there's too much friction, right? There's too much time that goes into that. 
And those are also very easy and cheap to outsource when you have the right systems and training for it, which is what we provide in short form mastery. Um, but if you delegate those aspects as well, then you can turn three hours of filming into 300 to 600 posts per yeah. month if you have the right preparation going into it, right? And so long story short, if you have like good quality content, uh, you're batching it and you have a lot of preparation before you start filming of the viral hooks that you're gonna be using for your talking head videos, or if you have scripts, you can have the scripts written out. If you're doing reaction content, or if you do a podcast, you yeah. can batch it all together and have it immediately just go to your drive, have an editor slash account manager who can go in, clip it up, work their magic, know what to do, and they post it out for you. And it's easy to do that. And now maybe you're doing two posts a day, maybe you're doing three posts a day per account, and you should be omnipresent. Another mistake that so many people make is they're only posting on Instagram, yeah. or only on YouTube, or maybe Instagram and TikTok. You should be on all platforms that we've listed. Again, that's Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, Snapchat, LinkedIn, X, post omnipresent across platforms. And that's gonna, if you're doing two posts a day across seven platforms, it's 14 posts a day. 14 times 30, that's 420 posts a month. So if you're doing 420 posts a month of top quality content with great editing, and you're using viral hook frameworks, you're using reaction content, you're doing on the street or podcasts, et cetera, you're already ahead of 99% of people. I saw a stat that there's 240 million creators. You're in like the top 0.05% already just by having those set up alone. Yeah. And then it's just a matter of time. Time is the biggest asset. Stay consistent with the process. And I promise you, you'll be shocked at what can build in even like a six month time frame, yeah. if not faster. Uh, I was thinking about Casey Neistat. You remember he'd make these 10 minute videos and mm -hmm. like it would take him 20 hours to edit or even like with Mr. Beast, he'd make a video that's nine minutes long and he mm -hmm. has an entire team that edits that that's for him. That's the key, he has yeah. the team. He has that team. Mm -hmm. uh, but like I could do a three hour podcast and I wouldn't have to edit any of it, yeah. throw it right up there uh -huh. and then just have someone grab clips with no editing. So mm -hmm. it's one of these funny things where my three hour video took me less time to make than his 10 minute video. Right. Like the, I was talking to Spencer Cornelia about this because Spencer okay. does these terrific 10 minute videos. Mm -hmm. And in his, his situation, it takes him forever to edit sure. these things as opposed to how what you're saying, take the long form content and cut the short pieces out. Mm -hmm. uh, also, you know, the, the idea of taking the best viral content that you have and using that for advertisement. That's mm -hmm. another great thing. Uh, yep. that Hermosi talks uh -huh. about that. The other thing is uh, when we were talking about Zoom, Zoom is great because you can put a bunch of people on the screen. It's not great because it doesn't go above 720. And mm -hmm. you, the, the yep. quality is not that great. So that's one of the issues uh, that we've had because when you try to do a digital, uh, digital Zoom in your Zoom footage, then mm -hmm. it doesn't look that well. No, so that's why OBS is better because you right. can record in 4K. And then the last one, which I think is the most important, is the number one thing I tell people if they want to start a podcast is the place that you do your podcast needs to be like easy to get to and very mm -hmm. comfortable to produce content yep. from. Mm -hmm. So I have a studio at home and then I have sticky nice. paws here is 11 minutes from my place because yep. I can't have 14 people in my apartment. But it's like um, the, like the, uh, as easy as possible. Mm -hmm. I let, man, I... I Go to the take pre workout, go to the gym, get a good pump, immediately sit your ass right there, turn the lights on, and start fucking recording. Like, that is a great idea because you're, you're, you're in your flow state or whatever. That is a great idea for consistently making content. I only, I only make my MOA modules and I only do the reaction videos right after the gym, mm. right after the gym. Uh, and so Why that, is that? Huh? You're just in a good state? Yeah, it's my brain. I'm just like ready to go. Mm. Like I have these crazy ideas. Maybe it's because I'm over caffeinated, but like I have these crazy <laughs> ideas and I'm just like ready yeah, to go at yeah, that yeah. point. Huh. Uh, and, I, and I get into a state where I want to do it every day. So I've gotten into a nice. every day now, it's either I'm going to do 10 reaction videos or build, or one module in MOA. Because mm. the problem with the modules is I have to go back through the previous module and I have to, to scrape out all the notes. And then I have to, whenever I record my modules, I do it in OBS and I have my notes sitting right on my face. It's mm. kind of weird to explain, but like my, the notepad is sitting on my face so I can see half my face and I'm reading the notes while I'm looking into the camera. Does that make sense? It's kind of like a teleprompter. Yeah. It's similar to that. So, so I have a teleprompter set up. Yeah, I have that too. It's, I, it's so helpful. So it's, the, it's easy to build the skill set. Yeah. It's not as hard as people think. And you can, the teleprompter is 200 bucks. You can buy an old used iPad for $100. Yeah. Only use it for a teleprompter. And there you go. You can upload your scripts into there and it makes it super seamless. Yes. To, if you are like going off of any type of script, or an outline for your video. Yeah, for outlines, I I just I just put the thing on the screen. For sure. the script, absolutely, the uh, the teleprompter and yeah. the teleprompter will have mm -hmm. like a remote that you can get with it. We uh, we just set one up. I'm mm -hmm. I'm gonna rec I'm filming ads tomorrow, 
And one thing Grant and I realize is with the teleprompter, it takes us a quarter of the time to film the ads as it does when I when I have to memorize the lines. That mm -hmm. part is kind of, that's why I didn't make it as an actor, because I can't memorize those yeah. fucking lines. Yeah, it makes sense. I also wanted to touch on another um, strategy when it comes to conversion specifically is using mini chat on Instagram. It's okay. It's absolutely crushing. And a lot of people are doing this through feed posts as well to where it takes more preparation going into it. They're writing out a full script for the feed post. Uh, and then it's usually value-based also, uh, breaking down a strategy such as maybe you are a day trader and you focus in on trading crypto, right? And you can go in and you say, hey, these are three things that I look for that give me an 80% success rate on day trading crypto and how I've made $10,000 in the last 30 days. It's so stupid simple. You can be 13 years old. All you need is Wi-Fi. This is how I do it. Step one, you break it down. Step two, you break it down. And then in the middle of step two, uh, you also mentioned a resource. You're like, I use this software. If you want free access to the software, DM me the word trade and I'll get that access or comment the word trade below yeah. and I'll get you access to it. And then they continue to go through the rest of the video and it's those comment the word or DM the word call to action. Yeah, we've done that for years. It's they work terrific. incredibly yeah. well. The, the click through rate on it is just insane for lead flow. Um, and you can use that with your feed posts to where these posts will go viral as mm -hmm. well. Um, because it's not like a full on ad, it's still giving a huge amount of value, uh, but then you're just dropping that in there as well. Um, someone that I've connected with recently, super cool dude, is uh, Tuzer. He does this incredibly well on Instagram. Shout out Tuzer. Um, is a really like pioneer their strategy and just crushed it through these uh, mini chat feed post type of ads. And you can also do it on your story as well. If you have mini chat flows LinkedIn, if you do a story CTA uh, call to action, on your story, just saying like, hey, like click the link below versus if you say DM me the word X, Y, Z, there is a difference of studies have shown a 20% click through rate of using the link sticker inside of the story versus if you say DM me the keyword, it can jump up to 77% yeah. of an increase in click through rate, which is just massive. Yeah, we just, use, I've saved replies. Whenever I get somebody send me the word, I send them the save reply, which which sends them yep. down to the yep. funnel. So that's that's Those something help. I've been doing. Mm -hmm. um, so I love that. And actually that segues to CTAs. So there are mm -hmm. different types of CTAs. That's the one that you like the best, which is DM me the word. Are there any other CTAs you like? Yeah, uh, so what we find works um, the best when it comes to organics is a really, really, really value packed, incredible free lead magnet. Mm it really does help. Um, so whether that's some type of PDF resource or a video or a mini course, like for us, 2 Billion View Secrets is our free mini course. And again, we've given away a lot of our best stuff in there to where people go through, this is just classic $100 million leads with Hermosi. That's a big th part of what he talks about in the book is create a free lead magnet and make it so incredibly valuable that people go through it. And it's just like, you see that and you're like, holy shit, I can't imagine how good their pay yeah. stuff is gonna be. You know, And it yeah. creates so much value, so much trust as well. And, um, then you are like you and your team, y'all really cracked the code on this. But if you go to your main opt-in page right now, it's as stupid, simple as can be. Yeah. It, it's actually like ugly as well. Like not the nicest design, but it's just like white background, black text, red text, red button. And like, that's it. No visuals. And y'all are like crushing on the opt-in rate. Yeah. We, we tried the VSL. It was funny because uh -huh. I had, um, uh, uh, Alex Mayer, Dr. Mayer, he's okay, uh, yeah. uh, Ty Lopez's yeah. partner. And we're asking him like, what, how do VSLs do? He goes, recently, we've been doing pages with no VSL and they do better. I was like, really? He's like, yeah, no VSL actually works better. So we tried it. It was funny. We were trying to get approved by a certain vendor who we were worried was not going to like the images of girls in bikinis. Mm. So we took the VSL down. Okay. That was, was the a reason. temporary thing. <laughs> And then sure enough, uh, the w the click through went up, the conversion rate went, went up. So we we kept it like that. We still do have a, a page that has, I love the VSL. I wish yeah. we, I'm yeah, going to yeah. put the VSL on Slack and just leave it there so you guys can just watch it. <laughs> yeah. I, we put a fucking ton of work in that VSL. Um, but yeah, that's that's something that I've noticed that that uh, worked out really well um, with the CTAs, the call to action thing. For me, I just tell people to DM me the word action. That worked out really well. We got a lot of leads, especially in the beginning mm. uh, when we did this. Um, so yeah, that one, that one worked out really well. The, uh, the other thing I want to ask what was about thumbnails. There's a strategy that someone told me about, and I noticed you guys were doing with my page, but I didn't, we didn't never discuss it, but it's great. So one of the things that happens is if you're a person who before two years ago had a grid of really good photos on mm -hmm. your page, what happens is your photo, your page is now littered with reels because yeah. you know that mm -hmm. reels are getting far more engagement. And just to let people know, um, I, I would say my engagement, I got like, uh, 2.7 million impressions 
uh, last month on Instagram, and I want to say 93% of it were from Reels, mm. and 91% of it was from people who didn't follow me. Yeah. So Reels right. go... So story. So yeah, so, non-followers. Yeah, so story will go to followers, mostly. Sometimes mm -hmm. story will go to other people, but mostly it's followers. Non-followers for stories, not so much. Reels, it's 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 nine to one. Yep. It will show your reels to people who don't follow you. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's really important to do that. One thing though is uh, my thumbnails were just basically a, a clip in there. You guys are taking, so here's what you guys did. You're taking photos that I used to have on my grid and uh -huh. you're using those as thumbnails on my reels. So it kind of looks like my grid again. Yeah. 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 So we just have a thumbnail. This is for Instagram specifically. Yeah. Um, is the only platform with short form where you can actually upload a thumbnail. Design yeah. Cause you can't do it on right shorts there. and you can't do it on TikTok. Yeah. yeah. TikTok is actually testing it. Some of our uh, accounts have that feature, but it's rare. Uh, most of our accounts don't have that. So we'll see if it ends up taking hold at all. So this is with Instagram, but yes, yeah, so we just have a easy, clean template that we've set up in Canva to make it stupid, simple for our team. Um, and then we add, the picture and it adds the aesthetic of the account makes the grid look so much nicer. Yeah. But also on top of that, it gives us another opportunity to have another headline that gets more clicks. Yes. The headline. Uh, if it when like on Instagram, it's going to, let's say the discovery page, explore page placements, like it's all over the place. Um, a lot of the time, if you have a thumbnail, you can use a headline that's going to make it more likely of people wanting to click on that video, see what it's about versus if it's just a frame and you're like, mid conversation, right? So uh, we have seen it overall um, help uh, our content perform better and get more views on Instagram as well. That's another free resource in 2 billion view secrets is the thumbnail template. It helps a lot. Um, and then going back, I wanted to touch on the, the CTAs as well again, yeah. just like the monetization piece from your socials. So going back to like create an incredibly valuable free lead magnet mm. and then have that uh, linked in bio. We like to use like Hoobie links, H O O dot B E yeah. or like link dot me works uh, great as well um, for the bio links to where they look super clean. You basically, they're like a landing page at this point and you can link all of your main socials across platforms. And then if you have long form content, like what I like to do is to take long form from short form. There's a variety of ways we do this. Um, but one of them is through the links and bios and like for you specifically, you have your, uh, your YouTube channel, for the visual on the podcast, the video podcast, then you have Apple Podcasts, you have Spotify Podcasts. Yeah. Those are really the big three of where people consume long form content. Yeah. So I like to have all three of those in the links and bios because one of those three are where people have the preference, right? And if yeah. you just have YouTube, not everyone watches podcasts on YouTube or vice versa with Apple Podcasts. Some people like Spotify, et cetera. And then you can have your free lead magnet also in there and then the rest of your main socials. You'll get a lot more traffic from that inside of the descriptions of the YouTube videos and of shorts, you can have links to your different, not in shorts, you can't do links anymore, but in the long form videos, you can have links to all of your uh, offers. Yeah, we and, do that. Um, yeah, yeah it's, it's, if you make the offer a sexy headline that has like a great benefit behind it, especially if it's free, you have like free tagged up there so people know, it's gonna get a good click through rate from your long form content as well. Um, and then inside of the actual edits, with the secondary accounts, we found best results of using them. They're really just assets that allow us to post more volume to get our clients more exposure, right? And so every single one of those posts is another billboard that you're mentioning is going to non-followers, people who haven't seen you before, don't know you. So it's an opportunity for you to get in front of them. And uh, we are optimizing almost all of the posts and then all the accounts to funnel that traffic back to our clients' main socials. So we'll do that through a variety of methods such as we'll tag uh, our clients and not all the posts because it gets flagged for spam behavior. If you're posting, let's say six times per day on a secondary account and tagging the same person six times per day. Yeah. Uh, but we'll tag them about half of the post. Uh, then we also do pin comment CTAs to where it's like, Hey, go check out like more content here. We'll yeah. tag their main social. Uh, they're in the bios of the accounts. We also use watermarks in the content to where like in the example of you uh, uh, being on screen, it'll show like at Michael Sartain in the content. So people yeah, know, yeah. or the podcast episode will show like Michael Sartain mm -hmm. podcast episode X, Y, and Z. And you know, that, you know how many times I've been uh, 
put on these aggregate vi viral video sites. Mm -hmm. and I, like mm -hmm. some of them get millions of views and they don't tag me. Yeah, I mean this I'm happens sure. all the time, dude. I, sure. uh, Derek Moore plates more dates. Use some of my clips. Uh -huh. uh, and he didn't even fucking <laughs> source me at all. Know, this happens like, all the time. On, That's man. why I'm like, I like the the, the idea of putting the watermark yeah. there because, uh -huh. like, bro, you are gonna know that I made this right. clip. You know what I'm saying? Right. So that is that is that's a really good one. Yeah, yeah, it helps definitely. And so all these different factors, and then our team will also add like call to action animations in the screen. It's like, hey, like an animation will come up, or like text will come up on the um, the video saying like, go check out the full length podcast. But we do it in a clean way that doesn't take away from the edit. So. There's a, there's a lot you can do as far as just the call to actions in general um, to be driving these, these placements and the traffic somewhere. Um, you mentioned before, uh, going back to the randomness, sometimes account, accounts randomly get shut down. Have you found a solution for this? Do you understand why? It's one of the strangest things. Yeah, especially with uh, creating secondary accounts. Yeah. There is a huge problem on social media of just people creating impersonation accounts sure. and using it to scam people, uh, which is unfortunate. So that is um, the algorithms across each platform have been set up to try and really like defend against this, yes. if you will. So when you create these secondary accounts, especially at the start, a lot of them will get flagged and taken down. But we do a lot uh, to avoid this as well of just using unique profile pictures on the accounts. Uh, we're like adding like fan page or fan account and just making it obvious that this is not like an impersonation account of each client and like copy and paste their bio, same profile picture, same feed, et cetera. Um, so I would say majority of them still get uh, approved and our account creation process is all of them are created by our team. Um, we won't do it all back to back to back. We'll like spread it out over the course of hours and days as well up front when we're creating the, uh, the accounts. And then we'll add um, three to nine posts as drafts inside of each account when we first create them to show intent to use it. And that's usually like two to three days before we start posting on it. Um, however, some of the accounts still do get like shut down, but when they get shut down, 99% of the time, they give you the option to appeal. And we have a really great appeal template that we use. Yeah. And it pretty much always gets approved very fast after that because the algorithm is what shut it down through mm -hmm. the parameters. And then when you appeal it, an actual person will go in and review it. Yeah. And then the appeal template is good as well to where it'll get approved back up. Uh, we have unfortunately had a couple accounts get shut down randomly after they've been running for like three months or whatever and like have built steam, built momentum and they just get shut down and we don't get them back. But it's been very rare. Yeah. So if we're like looking at the total amount of accounts that we've created and managed. Uh, the other concept, which I thought was interesting, is there was a, a kind of an epidemic going back 2016, 2017 of people buying fake followers. Oh, yeah. And there was no way to get rid of them. And a lot of the people like later on, weren't able to maintain the engagement to even keep up the facade that they had 10 mm -hmm. or 20 million followers. You talk about like the damage that that's done for some people. Yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate because like no one knew, right? Yeah. Like, a, a, and also there is just a huge wave of people doing shout outs or giveaway campaigns. Giveaways were the big one. And a lot of people were selling giveaways and guaranteeing X amount of follower count. It's like, if you're gonna guarantee that, they would buy fake followers to yeah. match that guarantee. To where some a lot of people would like buy these giveaways and didn't even know it was going to be fake followers. Uh, but regardless, even from the non-fake followers that came in from giveaways as well, they didn't follow you because they like your content. They yeah. followed you for a giveaway. They want the PS5. So, yeah, yeah, they want the PS5. They want the Lamborghini or whatever. And uh, it just it makes your engagement rate like plummet to yeah. where it, and then that affects negatively your account's performance. Um, and then also for fake slash botted accounts that also affects your account's performance. A lot of those accounts live on, a lot of them like just get shut down over time as well. And so it'll show like negative follower growth on your account also. So there's, there's a lot of reasons of why it negatively uh, affects it. Um, Instagram is the biggest one to where most people have like fake followings, bought their following. And a lot of people are in engagement groups as well to where it's like, it looks like they have great views and great comments but it's not legit. They're just in a group to where when they have a post go out, it goes to the group and they have bots or they have even just a bunch of real people. If it's like a huge 50,000 person group that will go like comment on it. Yeah. And it's all just emojis. No one actually watches the content. So you can see if it's genuine or not. Um, so long story short, these things, they don't build community. They don't build true audience. It's full of vanity metrics and a lot of it actually hurts your account. Um, so it's things that you want to avoid. We highly, highly recommend do not buy fake followers. People will still ask us that today. Um, and then if you have had this happen, just start running your account organically 
just like it never happened and you can build out of it over time yeah. uh, is our recommendation. And maybe it takes a little bit longer to stretch out, but yeah. you will stretch out of it. We also have had multiple people that we know hire like a VA to go in and like delete followers. So that's what I did. And, I yeah. did. Yeah. I did that for uh -huh. about a year. I had someone deleting followers for me, like a couple, 300 a day or something like yeah. that. It probably took off like 30, 40,000. And they weren't, they were just followers that like I, I said, I anything that's Cyrillic, anything that's Arabic or anything that's Portuguese, I uh -huh. want off my account. And like, no, no offense, if, you, if you're Brazilian and you want to follow me, please, I appreciate that. But I really do wish I could just, like a lot of people could get rid of the spam and get way better engagement if yep. we could just say India off, Indonesia off, mm -hmm. Iran off, Brazil off. All those followers just go away. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, you will go from 70,000 to having 40,000 followers, but your engagement goes up. Right. Because every time you post, it's going to active followers who are yeah. actually following mm -hmm. you. Nothing against anybody who speaks Portuguese. It's just you're probably not actually re uh, you know, reacting to my content. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's the issue. And also, yeah. you know, as far as the business is concerned, almost all sure. of my business is people who you know, lives in, live in Europe, Australia, or North America. So uh -huh. that's the reason why, you know, I, I kind of wanted that. But that's totally. just one of the really interesting things. And if you guys ever have a female influencer friend and she opens up her insights, you're going to see Tehran, Iran. You're going <laughs> to yeah. see Jakarta, Indonesia. Oh, these yeah. are your top spots. Everyone likes you in Jakarta. Yeah. No, that's where all the click farms are. So that's, yeah. that's where uh, a lot of that stuff gets started. Um, yeah, so it's really interesting. Who are the people who taught you? Uh, who are your mentors? Who are the people who taught you the strategies yeah. that you use now? So I've invested into countless program, like online coaching programs, digital programs at this point. A lot of the early ones I don't even remember and it's, it's been placed all over the place. But as far as direct mentors, I mean, early on, Jason Capital, yeah. um, I learned a good bit from him. Uh, Manny Koshman, obviously, I worked with him directly for over two years um, in person and just had an incredible wealth of knowledge and experience come through him. It wasn't uh, a lot on the social media side, but also just from... Uh, an investing side, he's a genius investor, brilliant, um, and has built his wealth that way. And also from a leadership side, operational standpoint, man time management, just skills in general, and like how to how to live and operate at a very high level. Um, and then right now we're uh, shout out Taylor Welch. We're in his mastermind, and it's incredible. Uh, we're his top level uh, mastermind called Chamber. Um, learned a huge amount from Hermosi, as most people yes. on the internet in our space at this point. He just continues to drop the sauce, and it's been uh, amazing. Um, and then just books. Books have been a huge mentor, like Elon. Uh, the, you mentioned you just finished the recent uh, Elon Musk book written by Walter Isaacson. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Um, the, the audio is like so clean to go through, and I've read from Walter Isaacson, Elon Musk, Steve Jobs as well. Both of those books have really stuck with me to where after I went through them, you feel like you learn how they think Dude, the and how they operate. The similarities are so crazy between the two of them. Yeah. Just yeah, like, no, we're going to get the, it's going to take us six months. We need this done this weekend. Right. We need this weekend or you're fired. Right. Like that kind uh, of thing. It's very similar yeah, between the two crazy of them. Crazy urgency. They call yeah. it the reality distortion fill with yeah. Steve Jobs. But like reading those books, it has changed the way that I operate. And I start to, you feel like you let you really ingrain lessons through them. And I'll ask myself a question. like, what would Elon Musk do in this situation? Yes. And you feel like you know the answer to that after going through these books. So books are incredible mentors as well. A lot of them have, you know, decades of knowledge into this one piece of material and you reading it essentially gives you 50 years of that knowledge and experience as well. Right. So it allows you to have just a huge edge and level up. Isn't it crazy? You mentioned Jason Capital. How many guys in this space came from pickup? Isn't it oh, yeah. nuts? Uh -huh. Do Evan Pagan, so you're talking about moving the free line. Moving the free line came from Evan Pagan 20 years ago, David D'Angelo. He mm -hmm. was the, the guy who created yep. the squeeze page. Mm -hmm. uh, when you think about the guy who the guys who run v, v Shreds, those were guys from Pickup. Uh -huh. uh, uh, you know, I'm trying to think who else. Uh, Derek Moore Plates, more dates. He's talking about coming from Pickup. Really? Yes. He did. Yeah, I he, didn't know he, that. He, yeah, he came from that. Interesting. Um, I mean, I'm talking like it's it's more rare when I find someone who didn't, mm -hmm. you know, what I'm saying who didn't at least have Spencer Cornelia. Yeah. Uh, he did. I mean, it's crazy when you actually mm -hmm. go back and you see how many of these guys were just involved in it in the early mm -hmm. days and then use that either becoming a coach. You know, Jason Capital is a, a huge example of that. Yeah. And then later on, pivoting into uh, Max Torno is another example of that mm -hmm. uh, freedom business mentoring. Um, 
they're, they're, these guys started in that arena, learned how to build a funnel, and then said, no, I'm going to teach business, or I'm going to teach marketing, or I'm going to teach something else. But yeah. the number of people that came from that arena over the last 15 years is crazy. It is crazy. It high. is really interesting. I mean, I also, I think it's like uh, when you're early on, like coming in that space, you're also learning persuasion, you're learning yes. influence, and that's like skills that can translate to also just marketing in general. And so you can have it like tear out into other areas. Yeah. That, that is interesting. Um, the other thing I thought was interesting was uh, Brett Cooper and the concept of where she was just doing reaction videos and built an entire platform from that. Oh and ben God, Shapiro she, doing the same thing. Yeah. Can you can you go into that? Like you, you see a lot of mainstream media now taking up some of these ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, reaction content. So with them, they're more news driven through yeah. Daily Wire, right? Um, but if you go to Brett Cooper's channel, uh, I believe she started less than three years ago and she's coming up on around 4 million subscribers. Her growth is insane we mentioned socialblade.com if you search her channel on that platform you'll see she's doing like 150 to 400 million views per month just on her youtube it's all reaction content um and so i know we already touched on this earlier in the podcast but it's just being strategic about what you're reacting to yeah. you can use it to brand yourself in a huge way you can react to more viral content also here's one other thing because uh -huh. i'm going to actually try this with some of my clients who have no brand at all mm. it makes you an authority that's another thing because you're Good judging point. this content, yeah. and uh -huh. so it's like I was I was telling my buddy, it's like just imagine uh, I have a friend of mine or uh, I have a new client today who hit me up and he owns a med spa, and mm -hmm. I was like, imagine if you did reaction videos to other people's videos on TikTok about a med spa, regardless of how popular it went, you automatically look like an authority figure. Like in my mind, you're just an authority yeah. figure, mm -hmm. uh, and then the reaction, and I was explaining to him like, dude, you can knock out thirty of them in like one day, mm -hmm. and then have somebody edit them, and there's so many different ways to edit them. Yeah. So yeah, that that thing, the the make Making you an authority figure. I'm mm -hmm. I'm actually working on ways for some of my clients to build a brand, but not for a business, for like dating, for like networking, stuff like that. Mm. So there's no, because there's no ROI, they can't have like a team of 40 editors. Sure. Like what are simple ways? And that's where I came up, man on the street and reaction uh -huh. videos and having a podcast. Those are easy ways yeah. and then you can clip right. those things out. Right. And then these guys are like, you know, how is it that I'm, I can grow my Instagram? Because, you know, not too many of us. You take your shirt off if you want and take pictures and see how that works for you, but it's not going to work too well. But if you can if you can put reels up there on a regular basis, you can have ag average Joe Schmoke. I have one guy who's a mortician, and he actually makes funny mortician videos that he, he copies. And it's brilliant. Like, the yeah. shit he does is absolutely brilliant. And by yeah. the way, it's the most recession, the most recession-proof <laughs> industry in the world is being yeah. a mortician. Incredible. He was like, yeah, during COVID, I was like, I was killing it, bro. It was incredible. <laughs> um, but it's... Um, you know, it's just one of these things where it's like, uh, there's, there's, we're talking about like, almost, not quite enterprise, but like, you know, I, my company's eight figures. And like, yeah. for, for that, we have uh, cash flow enough to afford to have an apparatus to make all this sure. content. 140 yeah. clips a day yeah. is what you're doing for me. And that's, yeah, that's what you like said. It's like an entire division within but, your company. But I need, I need to fund that division uh, from the revenue I right. get, from the, uh, the ROI that I get. And if I can't do that, then I can't afford that. That's, right. a, that's a significant amount of money. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have that, I was, I'm trying to come up with ways for my clients to be able mm -hmm. to do it. And that's why I said reaction video is a great way man on the street video is a great way. And then just like setting up a camera, doing a podcast like uh, with your iPhone via Zoom and interview yeah. other people uh -huh. and then take clips out of that. Yeah. That's another way. Riverside is, is recommended if you're doing yeah. digital podcasts. Yeah, Riverside. Going back to what you said about not going above 720. Yeah. Um, so Riverside will have better quality. But yeah, yeah I mean, digital podcast and... Uh, the, you'd be surprised of the amount of people who are open and want to get on a podcast. Yeah. You can open up so many doors for you. And then you can also get on other people's podcasts as well. Um, and that creates great content for you also. Um, and then you get to also connect with that person. You get to tap into their audience, get exposed to more new people. Um, and you'd be surprised at the amount of people who will also accept having you on as a guest as well. For yeah. a lot of people, especially if they are newer podcasts, if you're in their arena in any way, you're doing them a favor yes. of coming on as a guest. They just, they want guests. So the, don't be afraid to reach out and ask. The other thing, the other way that I've gotten some guests is I go on their show and I, I'm, it's almost like I'm auditioning. I also hired a bunch of my vendors, like Cole Gordon. He works for us now. He works with us okay. now because nice. he came on my show and he impressed us. Ah, nice. So that, that happens a lot. Char, that's mm -hmm. how we met Char. Well, I'd known Char for really? a decade beforehand, but Char had come on the show also. And so that's another thing the podcast can do is like from the hiring process. Yeah. You imagine, I was watching this video the other day. I was, I was t texting my sales team. I have a, like a closers chat that I'm in with them. Uh -huh. And uh, there was this guy, he was going in there. It was like, these are five tips for closing sales, blah, blah, blah. And he was just going off. It's very similar like what Jeremy Miner does. Who's uh -huh. coming? He's coming on next month. Nice. Uh, and I was watching this and I was, I was telling the guys, I was like, do you know how we had 800 guys apply to work for us? Mm -hmm. And we hired like you, just a, a few of you guys. 
we would hire this motherfucker right now from this video. Right. He's clearly yeah. read. Like, do you understand how? It's one of the funny things is like I've always wanted to work in like digital for different forms of media. Uh -huh. You would think me doing this job and saying crazy shit that offends people would make me less attractive for some of these mainstream jobs. And uh -huh. it actually has made me more attractive, which is crazy <laughs> to think yeah. of the other positions you or I could get because we decided to not work for a company and to be an entrepreneur and to build our own brand. Uh -huh. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. You yeah. want a social media manager for your company, but you why don't I pick a social media manager who's already built his own brand? and they can do it for you. So it's just one of these crazy things where it's like, you're right, you do have to post more. You just do, and it's like hard right. for people because they think it's try hard, or they think you're doing too much. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm doing too I, I much. Think, I think the big concern for a lot of people too is they think it's gonna like spam their audience. Yes. If they're posting more than once a day, it's not true. It's not true. Yeah. The algorithm has gotten good enough to where it knows who it should serve your content to. Yeah. And uh, for people who are like, uh, huge fans and they're engaging with all of your content, then yeah, it's going to serve more of the content, but there's going to be a portion of your audience as well to where it's only going to serve them your highest performing stuff, which is even better because now they're getting the better touch points on you. And then what you mentioned earlier, when you're posting reels, it's mainly going to non followers. Yeah. So it's not even overwhelming your current audience as well. It's, it's, it's a false belief. It's holding you back. Yeah. There's nothing, no single thing I think you can do for free to engage with more people who don't currently follow you than post reels. Uh -huh. TikToks, yep. uh, even, this happened for a, kind of across the board. I've talked to some other friends of mine who are influencers, that huge, that thing where every month you got one video hit 800K, uh -huh. that's kind of gone now. I don't yeah. feel, TikTok is moving out of the organic phase into the pay to, pay to play phase. At least that's what it feels like to me. Yeah. Um, and so because of that, the thing that I see that do, does the best are YouTube shorts, and um, Instagram reels, mm -hmm. where you can just have one go viral and use it in different places. Um, and so that's, you know, that's, that's the best piece of advice that I can give for somebody. But it's just like, you know, the point now we're building a personal brand is just, it's impossible. It's not impossible, but it's really hard to get by and not do it. And some of the guys right. who I knew, like, I remember um, I did a panel with Neil Patel one time. We were with uh, Dan Fleischman and Neil Patel was like, mm. yeah, I, you know, we still do email blasts and uh, you know what I'm saying? We do business to business stuff. And uh, we were, we were big before social media. Now look at Neil Patel. Uh -huh. The guy's just crushing it, giving incredible yeah. advice. I believe he's doing more than a hundred million a year. Oh my gosh. He sat here one time. He was like, yeah. Uh, so I, on average, I spent about $384,000 a month just for like living expenses. And I want to cut that down. It was, it was like crazy. Baller. It was like the numbers he was saying is crazy. Yeah. He said, I put, he goes, I put my children in a, um, in a, what's it called? A non-contestable will. What's an uncontested, uh, what's it, a trust, a non, an trust. irrevocable uh, trust. Yep. He goes, I put uh, my, but it showed irrevocable trust. I didn't realize that they were going to inherit $90 million. It's like, <laughs> that's going to ruin. Like, yeah. I wish that I hadn't given my kids 90 million. It's so uh, yeah. crazy. It's the millionaire next door. That's one of the books that talks about like not leaving a bunch of money to your kids. Uh -huh. um, but it's just so funny. Like when you, when you see that kind of, uh, and by the way, spamming people, Grant Cardone, Jesus Christ! Like there, there was points where he was just crushing. He's Every five shit. seconds, you yeah. would see him on Facebook, and uh, the you know story. Brad Lee was like, "Hey man, you're you're posting too much. I'm gonna have to unfollow I saw, you." I saw him on the podcast and, talking about and, it. And Brad, <laughs> Brad and Grant Cardone's like, "You don't even buy, motherfucker. I don't care." And yeah. hangs up on him. So Let's, you're not buying from. You're me. not buying from me. It doesn't matter. It is so crazy, man. It's like one of those things. Yeah, I'm over here doing too much. Like the guy who's over there doing too much has got the girl and the money. So you uh. can make up your mind <laughs> if you want to do too much or not, or if this is not enough for you. Yeah. The guy who Who's doing too much is in shape. The guy who's doing too. Mm -hmm. We had um. So we had a couple of guys, Alex Costa and um, Fidex Fearless come on, and then we had okay. uh, 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 Adam Pereira come on, uh, Adolfo okay. Tex. Oh, those they're looks maxing guys. I like. I'm I'm getting into this kind of like looks maxing thing, trying to nice. understand it. Yep. And it was like one of the complaints that all three of them had was that people thought you were doing too much because you were putting moisturizer on your face or you're fucking taking yeah. care of your hair. <laughs> yeah. You're doing too much. And right. I'm like, the dude who's doing too much just stole your girl. Like, uh -huh. so just wake the fuck up. Right. That's the way I see it. So yeah. anyway, man, no, this is really great stuff. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs in here. I know a lot of people want to build a brand and that we're going to be interested in hearing what you had to say. Uh, I love talking about people's software stack because I think a lot of people think it's too nerdy, but no, man, yeah. it's so, when you guys understand it's crucial. Like, how, high leverage. How, how much, le exactly, how much power you can have with so little effort. Mm -hmm and how much organization you can use with some of these software tools. Loom, guys, if any of you work, I, I wish I had Loom when I was in the military because I would have to write out these books, these pamphlets oh, to, live to, mm. to give to the guy who was replacing me. So when I get yeah. promoted from Got first it. lieutenant to captain, 
I, I leave my office, I go to another office, I got to give the new lieutenant in there, and he has a book with standard operating procedures. Man, if I had Loom, it would have been so <laughs> much easier to do that back then I'm than the sure. way it is now, man. Yeah. It's just so great, the, the amount of stuff that you can get done, mm -hmm. you know, uh, frame.io and all this kind of stuff. So the productivity tools that are out there, and then also, like we said, this is something we really didn't touch on much, but the ability to capture a community. Mm -hmm. So Circle, mm -hmm. Uh, school, yep. Discord, mm -hmm. Telegram. Those things are another productivity tool mm -hmm. that you can use that are that are just really great to get your message out. Hundred uh, percent. And and uh, and what's the new thing on Instagram? The um, you just mentioned broadcast. Uh, yeah, broadcast channels. Yeah, broadcast uh -huh. channels. So that's another great way to like capture an. Um, capture leads and to capture a community and yeah. have them all engage yeah. with broadcast each other. channels are incredible. Yeah, such a good free resource. Yeah. Just a new newsletters blast for you. Definitely. Uh, where can people find you and where can people find uh, media scaling? Yeah. So we're at mediascaling.com. Uh, my socials are Logan Forsyth. I, we preach omnipresent so you can find me anywhere. And then our 2 billion view secrets, free mini course. I mentioned incredible free resources are at go.mediascaling.com forward slash secrets. Love it, man. Hey man, I appreciate it. Hey, I uh, appreciate all you guys. Uh, Cause I know some of you, um, uh, have commented this the variety of different guests I try to have on here. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, I'm trying to get another experimental physicist back on. Nice. I don't want to like be pigeonholed into one space. Sure. But yeah. I the reason why I do that is because I respect the intelligence and the curiosity of the audience. Yeah. I don't. Mm. I understand that there's an audience out there for like three second clips of a cat fighting something other some other yeah. shit, and that's fine, right? Some alien conspiracy shit or some like one minute long videos, and that's great. But I do believe that there's still an audience for a guy who wants to listen to. Elon Elon Musk talked to Joe Rogan for three hours. Yeah. That audience still mm -hmm. exists too. And that highbrow audience, I think that is probably a little bit more intelligent. I respect that audience, which is the reason why I try to have a lot of different people on here. Mm -hmm. And I try to go nerdy with them. Yeah. I try to get really detailed and go nerdy with them uh, because I feel like I, I respect my audience is intelligent enough to, to think that. And so that's mm -hmm. the audience I want. So totally. if, I, if I don't end up with 50 million subs, that's so that's fine. I think I got the, I got the subs that I like. And by the way, just hit 80,000 today. So thank you guys so much yeah. for, for, uh, for helping me out with that. Uh, man, uh, so we can find you at those different places, man. Please check out Media Scaling and check out his, uh, you know, you're building your personal brand. You're going on a, a podcast tour, which is awesome. We just hired a guy to book me on a bunch of podcasts nice. today. Nice. So we're excited to do that. And we We'll see all of you guys next week. All right.